Hi everyone, I'm Michelle Alexander and I welcome you to our online modern worship experience. It is my prayer for you that this experience connects you to God in a real and powerful way and that you will be a bridge builder to Jesus Christ. And my name is Jamie Prickett. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. So we do want to welcome you and glad that you have chosen to be our guest today. I want to let you know what you can expect over the next um, few minutes. After this welcome, we'll go into a time of prayer. Then after the prayer, there will be a message. We're going to finish out our series today on prayer. So we'll be talking about the Lord's Prayer in that series. And then after the message, we will be having a time of worship music together. So I'm glad that you're here with us today. And so we've been hard at work in this building, getting it ready for you to come back to live in-person worship next Sunday, October the 18th. Jamie, tell us what times we're going to be meeting. All right. So October the 18th, we'll be back in person, as Michelle said. So at 9 a.m., we'll be modern worship in the great room. We'll be live streaming that. Then 10 a.m., chapel service in the chapel. We will not be able to live stream that. Then 11 a.m., we'll be having classic worship in the sanctuary, and we will be live streaming that service as well. And... There will be child care and children's ministry programming for all you families. So please come on out, come back in live worship, social distancing, all those protocols being in place, masks. So we look forward to seeing you. Can't wait. We are so excited. And if you want to connect with us, go to gfumc.com forward slash connect. Our purpose here at Gainesville First United Methodist Church is to build bridges to Jesus Christ in our community and around the world. During this challenging season of restrictions, we continue to look for creative ways to reach out and demonstrate our love to our neighbors. And because of the volunteer effort and the financial donations that have been made, we were able to provide this past Thursday with 500 meals um, to our community. So I just wanna say thank you. Thank you for your, your willingness to continue to build bridges to our community. Now let us pray. Gracious God, you are our rock. You are our redeemer. Enlighten us today through the witness of your word. Lead us and guide us. We know we have no righteousness of our own. We have bent and ignored your will and what is best for us and what is best for your world. We have given lip service to doing what is right. And if we're honest, we just lack motivation. So, Lord, in your mercy, forgive us today, we pray. And remind us that you know us deeply, that you love us deeply, and that you have a purpose for each and every one of us. Our lives are in your hands. Help us to use well what all that we have been given. And may we know heaven on earth because you hold first place in our priorities and our daily goal is to serve you. We pray this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Before we get started today, I just want to take a moment to say thank you for taking time out of each week to be our guest. 
in whatever platform you have watched us on, whether that be Facebook, YouTube, or our website, we are truly grateful. And we're honored that we get to serve you in this way. For those of you that have shared with your friends over these past few weeks and months, we appreciate your willingness to get the word out. And as you heard in our introduction, and in case you've missed it, we are returning back into the building on Sunday, October the 18th, and we're excited. But if I had to be truthful, we're somewhat anxious as well, anxious about what exactly it will look like. But we are trusting We are trusting the guiding hand of the Lord, and we're confident that this is the right time for us to begin gathering together. Now, I know that some of you are not comfortable to return yet, and and we want to honor that decision. And so there still will be this online presence, and, and we're going to work hard to be intentional on engaging with you um, during this time. So for those who are thinking about returning in person, I want to remind you that we're going to be following social distancing protocols, and we're going to be wearing a mask, and and we want to encourage you to to go ahead and be on the lookout, check your email, and um, you'll get a message from us on how to RSVP. And, And here's the thing, if you have any questions about any of this, I don't want you to hesitate to reach out. Please reach out. Actually, reach out to me personally. My email is J Prickett, J-P-R-I-C-K-E-T-T, at G-F-U-M-C dot com. And I'm not going to tell you I have all the answers, because I don't, but I will work hard to figure out who does and get you connected to the right person. So let's get started. Let's, this is our final message on this series on prayer. You know what keeps me from praying more? than theological challenges or questions raised about God. What keeps me from turning to God in prayer is my pride. Pride, at least in me, shows up in stubbornness. It it binds us to our own need. and, And pride has a way of despising authority, despising responsibility, and accountability. Pride claims independence. And if I'm my own person, why do I need God? So pride keeps us from praying. Now, we can make all the excuses in the world. You know, we don't have enough time or we don't know how or, you know, what should I pray for or why should God even listen to my prayers? But the truth is, Most of the time, it's our own pride and and self-determination that keeps us from praying. We don't actively rely on God because we proudly think that we can do it on our own. and We can do it all on our own without God's help. I'm reminded of a story when Ronald Reagan was still governor of California. He was asked to give a speech in Mexico City. And Reagan writes about this uh, experience. He says, after I had finished speaking, I sat down to a rather unenthusiastic applause, and I was a little embarrassed. He goes on to say that the speaker who who followed me um, spoke in Spanish, which Reagan says, I don't understand, and he was being applauded almost every paragraph. Well, to hide his embarrassment, Reagan said, I just started clapping every time he spoke. I would clap before everyone else clapped, and I would clap longer than everyone else clapped. Until, Reagan said, our ambassador leaned over and he said to me, I wouldn't do that, Mr. Reagan. You see, that man is interpreting your speech. Pride, pride is, is, pride is clapping foolishly at our own accomplishments, thinking that we alone are responsible. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says, If you think you're standing, watch out that you don't fall. Galatians 6, 3, For those who are nothing think they are something, they deceive themselves. Then the wisdom writer of the Proverbs, Pride goes before destruction. So how do you know you struggle with pride? 
Well, we live in a selfie world, so I, I like what Max Lucado says. He, Max Lucado uh, explains, suppose you are in a group photo, and the first time you see the picture, where do you look? And if you, if you look good, do you like the picture? And if you're the only person who looks good, do you still like the picture? But what if some in that group photo were cross-eyed and others had spinach in their teeth, but you still look good? Do you like the picture? And if that makes you like the picture even more, then you've got a bad case of pride. Now we know that the key to living beyond pride is humility. Humility is not thinking necessarily poorly of yourself. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's simply thinking about yourself less. All that to say, Jesus sandwiches his model prayer, what we call the Lord's Prayer, what others in other um, Christian traditions call our Father Prayer. Jesus sandwiches this model prayer between two lessons on humility. In Matthew chapter 6, in, in verse 1, he says, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. And then he goes on to say, in, in six verses later, five verses later, he says, When you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father in heaven who sees in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then you get to the, in, in the middle is the, the Lord's Prayer, the, the model prayer that he gives, gives us. And then when you get to the end of the, of the model prayer, the end of the Lord's Prayer, Jesus begins to also turn our attention back to humility once again. And this time he's talking about fasting. And he says when you fast, this is basically what he says, when you fast, don't look like you're fasting. Don't walk around and, and have this, you know, look at me, pity old me, you know, I'm starving, I'm doing this for, you know, to get some attention. He says, don't do like the hypocrites. They just do it for the attention. And so in between these two teachings on humility, Jesus says, when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Don't be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Therefore, Jesus says, you need to pray in this way. And then He gives us this prayer and He says, Pray in this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. And then he says in verse 14, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Jesus gives us this prayer. In Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, in the Gospel of Luke, we have this model prayer. And Jesus gives us this as a lesson on how to pray. Now, we're not the author, and we're not even the subject of this prayer. We are simply the recipients of this prayer. And it's a prayer that, that, that gives direction on how we are to live our lives. It's a prayer that serves to, to shape us into the image of Christ. Some early Christians have likened this prayer to, the, to the, the, the bow of a ship. And it cuts through the waters of life, pushing a, a, all that, that keeps us from participating in the kingdom of God, pushing all of that aside. And it's a bold prayer. I want you to see this, the boldness of this prayer. And I want you to understand it takes courage to pray this prayer. Because you're, you're going through the prayer, you're, you're halfway through the prayer, and then all of a sudden you, you, you come upon those words, Thy will be done. And that kind of like just 
it kind of just sneaks up on you. And you realize this is not a selfish prayer. Because we're asking God to do whatever God wants to do with our life. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Asking for the way of of God's kingdom, the way of of God's will, and, and, and the way of God's purpose to be done on earth as it is in heaven, the way of grace and forgiveness and love of enemy. We're asking for all of that to be demonstrated in and through our lives. Friends, that's a bold prayer. And I don't even get to the second part of the prayer. You, you have words like give us, forgive us, lead us, deliver us. That takes humility. Because it takes a certain amount of humility to say, I can't do this alone. I thought I was powerful. I, I thought I had it together. I thought I could, I, I could conquer the world, but I can't. So give me daily substance. Forgive me of the mess that I've made. And lead me away from all that my heart is trying to get me to walk into Deliver me from all that is tempting me at this very moment. It's been said that that the only thing that makes this prayer bearable is the very beginning. Our Father. If God is anything like a, a decent, caring, loving, human Father is supposed to be, then maybe we can risk approaching God like a child depended upon God for everything. Speaking of children, when a child who hasn't ate in days prays for her daily bread, and I, as a a middle-class American with a a freezer full of, of food, praying for my daily bread, What's the difference? For that starving child, it is about her daily provision. She needs food to survive. For me, and for many of us watching this, I think it's about the change of our heart. It's about the the change of our heart to see and to be open that I might actually have contributed to the fact that she doesn't have food while we live in a world of waste. And also how I might can help provide her with that daily bread. The heart, the heart of the Lord's prayer is recognizing our dependence upon God. And that's why I said at the beginning, this is why Humility is required of, for us to approach God in prayer. The Lord's prayer teaches us that, that we are helpless without God. And being raised in a, in a self-reliant culture, that makes, that's hard to acknowledge. That's hard for us to accept. The struggle is the posture of our heart. Not necessarily the logic behind praying. Starting your day off in prayer, it just restores your dependence on God. I think Philip Yancey, the the author, speaks for all of us when he says, I worry about do I have a sense of God's presence in prayer? Where the, the real issue is, does God sense the presence of me? Prayer is about being honest. And that takes humility. A distinguished art critic was studying a a painting by an Italian Renaissance master one day, and he stood in, in London's National Gallery gazing at this magnificent, beautiful painting of Mary holding the infant Jesus on her lap. And the Catholic saints, Dominic and and Jerome, were kneeling nearby. 
And yet the painting itself troubled this art critic. I mean, there could be no doubt that the artist was a, a person full of skill. His color, his use of color, and his use of composition was excellent. But the proportions of the picture were just slightly wrong. The hills in the, the background seemed exaggerated as if they might just sort of topple over the, the frame onto the gallery's floor. And the, the two kneeling saints, um, they just looked awkward and uncomfortable. And almost like the, the infant in Mary's arm is just going to roll out of the painting at any moment. So Robert Cumming, the art critic, was not the first to criticize this work of art. There was a whole line of folks before him that criticized this piece. But he would be the last. Because it suddenly occurred to Mr. Cumming that the problem was not with the artist. The problem was with him. You see, the art had never intended to even hang in an art gallery. The, the, the painting had been commissioned as an altarpiece intended to hang in a place of prayer. So I want you to picture this. This dignified art critic in London's National Gallery dropped to his knees before the painting. And suddenly he saw what generation of art critics before him could, had missed. And from this newfound position, Robert Cumming found himself gazing up at a perfectly proportioned piece of art. You see, it wasn't the, the, the perspective of the painting that was wrong. It was the perspective of the people looking at it. Robert Cumming on bended knee had found a reality that Robert Cumming, the proud art critic, couldn't see. So I know we titled this message, What Should We Pray For? And you're like, dude, you, you hadn't answered that question. But I did. For if you pray for a humble heart, everything else that you think you should or shouldn't be praying for just seems to fall into place. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Die.
jealous of me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory And I realize just how By the grace in his eyes If grace is an ocean We're all sinking yeah. So heaven meets earth Like a sloppy wet kiss And my 